ಭಗವತೋ ಅರ್ಹತ ಸಂಬುದ್ಧ ನಮೋ ತಸ ಭಗವತೋ ಅರ್ಹತ ಸಂಬುದ್ಧ ನಮೋ ತಸ ಭಗವತೋ ಅರ್ಹತ ಸಂಬುದ್ಧ ಗುಡ್ ಈವ್ನಿಂಗ್ ಎವ್ರಿವನ್ ಟುಡೆ ವಿ ಆರ್ ಗೋಯಿಂಗ್ ಟು ಇನಿಷಿಯೇಟ್ ದಮ್ಮ ಪ್ರೋಗ್ರಾಮ್ ಅವರ್ ಕಾಸ್ ಅಬೌಟ್ ಬೇಸ್ಡ್ ಆನ್ some dhamma clarifications i would like to say it as uh, answering some questions raised by uh, that was prevailing in the buddhist community and uh, this these questions have been answered by the most late most venerable uh, redu kane chanda vimala mahathera in his book called dhamma vinichcha i think most of some of you who are sri lankans would be would be able to would, would be familiar accustomed with this book and there are 100 questions that are be discussed and those questions were prevailing in the 90s 50 1950s uh in the society of the buddhists so by i what i found was by clarifying these questions and they, those questions are very practical and are that very much related to our day to day lives so that would enlighten us and give shed shed light upon uh in certain fields uh of, of buddhist life so we can uh mm. clarify our uh doubts and also uh uncertainties about certain issues such as uh what would happen to the donations that are made to the sangha and how could the sanghika dana could properly be made and some questions related to karma and some questions related to the buddhist literature and also uh, certain questions that are among the big buddhists about paying respect to buddha statues and so forth so the order is given by the mahathera so i'll be following according to the order uh, some questions are, are will be very imperative while others will be uh, ordinary ones but anyway uh, all of them will uh, give us uh, uh, more uh, knowledge and enable us to clarify other doubts even uh, based on the knowledge that we gather through or gain through these uh, discussions so i'll if i give a brief introduction to this uh, program so the book we book is called dharma vinishya it's written in singhalese letters dharma vinishchaya uh, yeah vinishchaya but in pali it would be dhamma dharma become dhamma vinishchaya is a sanskrit word it become vinichchaya vinichchaya means uh clarifying or or solving a certain issue giving a certain answer or a solution to something vinichchaya sabha was the place where uh in courts uh, where disputes have been were been settled vinichchaya sabha vinichchaya khara means uh, the person who uh, solve the disputes so that's a judge courts are vinichchaya sala judges are called vinichchaya khara dhamma vinichchaya means the solutions that are given to certain dhamma issues that are questions that are related to the dhamma and mahatera has organized them in a certain uh, into certain groups when you read the 100 questions you are able to understand why he has arranged them in such a such a order uh, but uh, anyway uh, the first few topics will be quite ordinary uh, some may have doubts about certain topics and some may not so it depends on the type of the personality and also the nature of the question so the first question that is i think i have given you a handout and if you are interested in following these lectures uh, in future you are well well invited to join a whatsapp group and a viber group uh, run by the institute and you can join so all the uh, information regarding the co- regarding the lectures and all the handouts will be distributed in these groups so you can have your handout i'll be referring to this handout and it's been translated the singhalese book has been translated uh, part by part and now i have given 10 questions i will not be able to do all the 10 today for sure and we are going to have this uh, 
lecture, these lectures on every first Sunday, first Sunday of a month, every first Sunday, but only this week because we had some, uh, we had to do Abhidhamma lesson in the first week of this month, so we postponed it to the second week. So since, uh, since uh, from the next month, we'll be doing the program on every first week, every Sunday at 8 p.m. to 10 p.m. Sri Lanka time. The first question, so if you are, I'm referring to the handout that I have given, if anyone didn't get the handout, I kindly request uh, Udhyani Unantana to uh, post this, so share this in the chat box so some others can download it. Did the Buddha make a rule or request that his disciples must make statues of him and worship them? Because sometimes on those days in 1950s, there was a, a, a certain sect emerged in Sri Lanka uh, refuting all the ideas of paying respect to Buddha statue. Because Buddha statue is something made out of clay or something made out of uh, some material. And this has no specific living essence and this has no relationship with the Buddha. Uh, it made sense to most of the people that paying respect to the Buddha's relics because they belong to his body part and also paying respect to the Bodhi tree under which he got enlightened made sense to many because they have some kind of a relationship with the actual Buddha. But when it comes to a Buddha statue which is made out of some clay taken from the, taken from the earth or a Buddha statue made out of wood or some other material uh, in these days, it has no whatsoever relationship with the actual Buddha. So, if so, what is the purpose of paying respect to a Buddha statue? First of all, the first question that he is asking is, did the Buddha made any such request that Buddha statues, uh, statues of him should be made? So, in the Tipitaka, we don't see such a request or such an order given by him. Obviously, that is Mahatera's opinion. A person who is quite humble and who has less desires and especially someone who has fully eradicated the desires would not prefer or would not suggest others to make a statue of him. That's, obvious, that's an obvious thing. Even a monk who has less desires would not, if someone makes a statue, that's a different case. But we would not ask someone to do so because if you are telling someone to make a, make a statue of yours, it shows that there is some kind of a, some kind of a expectation of veneration, of popularity. A Buddha, someone who has completely eradicated all the defilements related to greed and conceit, would never request a person to make such a statue because it's it's against their ethics. It's the, against their actual mindset. But it is true that by making a Buddha statue and paying respect to the Buddha, to that statue, one can accumulate great merits. But the first question the Mahatera is asking, did the Buddha make a rule or request that his disciples must make statues of him and worship them? The clear answer is no. The clear answer is no. So before we read the handout, Mahatera had given a very nice story which happened in the Buddha's time, during the Buddha's time. Once they are one, when the Buddha was, uh, because every morning, early, every early morning, he normally investigates the world, check the living beings, and find out is, if there is anyone, if there is anyone who, uh, to whom that he could preach Dhamma and rescue from the sansara or give some relief in the sansara. So at that time, one, one morning, he saw a, a lady of a low caste, uh, in Pali they were called Chandalas, Chandalis, in, in, in the Sri Lankan society also, uh, quite uh, till recent time, there were some, some castes called Chandalas, mostly they are called aus outcasts. So uh, a lower caste lady, an old lady, a feeble lady, who was about to die, an outcast lady who was about to die, uh, came into the Buddha's vision and he, show, he, he saw that this lady was 
about to die today itself, that day itself, and was going to be born in the great hell, in the great hell. But there was a possibility. Buddha saw the possibility. That's the, that's the, that's the magnificence or the uh, benefit of having a Buddha. Because he can see if a certain karma could be prevented or not. He could see, he can see the possibilities of, of the good side and of, also of the bad side. So therefore, then it's, he saw that it's possible that this person, that, that karma is preventable. You, you could prevent that karma. So if that lady at least pay respect or homage to the Buddha, uh, she would be able to making that a karma proximate to the death, closer to the death, we call it asana karmas. So she will be able to be born in a divine realm. So what happened was he, with the Mahasangha, he, while he was going for Pindapath in the early morning, uh, he went into the, took a direction, took a road, took a path uh, that led towards the, where the lady was living. And on the way, while he was going for searching for arms, he met the lady face to face. She was coming towards the Buddha and Buddha was coming with the Mahasangha. Uh, then they were uh, facing each other. So suddenly the lady stopped and Buddha also stopped, Buddha stopped in front of her. And the lady also stopped because he was a very respected person in the society, a person who has abandoned the household life. Actually, he abandoned his kingship that was awaiting him and also a good family life and abandoned the household life in his prime youth. And he was of a good appearance as well. So uh, he stood in front and the lady obviously uh, had heard about him. And she, she was very respectful, but uh, she didn't know what to, how to, what to do with her, what to do with him. So, so she just kept looking at him. At that time, Mahamoggallana read the Buddha's mind, understood what the Buddha was thinking. Buddha was expecting her to worship her. For what reason? Is it to gain some respect from an outcast lady? No, obviously not. He's a person who has been venerated, respected even by the kings even by the emperors who were controlling, who was, who was uh, ruling the uh, countries of his, of his era. So there's nothing that he could gain by, uh, from a worship or done by an outcast lady, and especially an old lady who was about to die today. So, but his intention was that she could, by respecting him, he, she could accumulate a great merit that would take her to a divine destination, divine realm, rather than falling into, a, into the great hell. So Mahamoggallana read his intentions and asked the lady to pay respect to the Buddha. So following his orders, she, I think she was not of very high intellect, it seems like, and she respected, paid, paid homage to the Buddha. And in that day, she died and she was born in a divine realm. And while Mahamoggallana was traveling, uh, in the uh, divine realms, uh, is my, if my memory was correct, she, he met her and this story was said to her, said to him. And so, so Mahat, what Mahatera's argument is, now even on that occasion, he didn't ask the lady to pay respect to him. So even in such an occasion, he didn't ask her to pay respect to him. So how could he make a rule or a request that his statues would be made? and paid respect at. So it's not something a Buddha would do. It's also obvious in some sutras and also in the Vinaya, Buddha has clearly mentioned Buddha deserves veneration. Buddha deserves veneration and Buddha is a person who deserves veneration not only from humans but also from Devas and Brahmas because obviously he has reached the culmination of wisdom and the psychic powers and he deserves that he has eradicated all the defilements including the latent habitual tendencies which we call vasana uh, but it's uh, so but he there's no such state maybe there are one or two on special occasion that he's asking see, people to pay respect to him but he normally he doesn't do that he doesn't do that so therefore Mahatira is of the argument that Buddha has never made such a request. But he didn't deny or he didn't made he didn't say that not to make any may not to make any statues. For example, uh, when the Mahaparinibbana was going to happen, was about to happen, 
Venerable Ananda, who was struck by great grief, came to him and asked, how should we arrange your funeral uh, rituals? Uh, how to make the pyre and what cause sort of celebrations or respects that we, respect that we should make. At that time, Buddha said, uh, you don't need to bother about that. You just worry about your own practice. The lay people would take care of it. It's a, it's, it's a duty of the lay people to honor the Buddha's body. Then he asked, how, how should they respect the Buddha's body? And he said, Buddha's body as... Uh, the Tathagatas because that's the ritual how the Tathagatas body should be treated he said it should be treated like a normal it should be treated like the body of a Chakravati and how should it be done then he explained what the procedure for that so because it, it was asked the question was asked so likewise Buddha is not a person who would arrange or who would say to vener others to venerate him because he has completely eradicated the desires of receiving respect is eradicating the desires of receiving respect. So the answer for this question is no. So we shall read this handout and then we'll go try to explain uh, the specific points. The Buddha did not make any rule or request that his disciples create statues of him and worship them. Noble beings like the Buddha do not have the desire to receive veneration from others. Those who have such desires are usually influenced by defilements and selfish ideas. One day in the early morning, the Buddha was observing the world to see whom he could help. He saw an old lady in Rajagaha who was about to die and be reborn in hell. To help her, the Tathagata went into the city of Rajagaha in search of arms. His objective was to inspire the old lady to pay, pay him respect and accumulate great merit, leading her to a blissful destination after death. The Tathagata met the old woman who was walking with the help of a stick. She was very feeble. He stopped in front of her but did not ask her to pay respect to him or perform a meritorious deed. At that moment, Mahamoggallana Thera, knowing the Buddha's intentions, recited the following verse to encourage the old woman to pay respect to the Tathagata. Chandhali vanda padani gotamasya sasino Taveva nu kampaya atha sisi muttamo Chandhali, the outcast lady. Please pay respect to the respect at the feet of Gotama, whose fame, who has high fame. Taveva nu kampaya atha sisi muttamo. This great sage stood here, stopped walking, uh, having compassion towards you to help you. May you have gladness or faith or pious, the feeling of faith towards Arahantas who have eradicated defilements and who, are, who does not change based on the objects Tadini. Kippang Panjalika Vanda, may you pay respect to him quickly. Parittan Tavajivitang, you have a very short lifespan left. The old woman paid respect to the Buddha, died on the same day and was reborn in the divine realm. See appendix for the full story. I have given you the appendix, but it's in Pali actually, uh, because uh, this would be a book also would be given to monks to study in our institute, so they can read their Pali, so that's why I have given the Pali story. The Buddha did not accept meals offered by the Brahmins, Kasi Bharadwaja and Sundarika Bharadwaja because he had already delivered Dhamma verses to them before the offering. So there are few occasions in which the Buddha had preached the Dhamma first and while they got inspired by the Buddha's preaching, they invited or offered, or offered them the meals. So at that time, Buddha normally rejects it because it may amount, but it's in terms of the sila or in terms of vinaya, bhikkhu vinaya, that's not an issue. I may preach a dhamma and he may be pleased about me and or do some offering. I, I have the full right to accept that. But normally Buddhas don't do it with regard to meals. With regard to meals. If they happen to preach a certain dhamma and inspire the person and get having inspired, if the person requests to, starts to, tries to offer some meal to him, he normally rejects it and he says to throw it away because that had been dedicated to the Buddha already. 
So uh, therefore, and he, he, he even rejected the meals. Given this, how could the Buddha make a rule or request for others to create statues and worship him when he had not even asked others to pay respect to him? He would never do so. So the custom of making Buddha statues did not originate from the Buddha himself. It, was, it is not due to an instruction or due to an order or a rule made by the Buddha. Although the Buddha did not ask for respect or veneration, he would accept them from pious devotees along with their offerings. When people, are, people have gathered and wanted to offer him, he would not reject it because it's a, uh, it's a good gesture for them to accumulate great merit of paying respect to a, such a venerated, venerated or venerable person. And uh, he even would praise that if someone pays respect to him, that the person would get gain abundant enough merit because that's that's something which is actual in the uh, reality. So out of compassion he would do that. But there are some instances. There's a one instance in a very special sutra. I forgot the name of the sutra actually. Uh, that was uh, uttered to venerable Nagita or some some of the attendants uh, when when uh, people gathered to the monastery, or monastery they were, they were Buddha's residence, and they were going to offer, they have brought lots of gifts, and also they were going to praise, they were ready to praise the Buddha, and they requested the attendant monk, and he came and said, the Buddha, people are awaiting outside, and they are looking forward to uh, pay a lot of res pay respect to you, and make a lot of offerings, then he rejected it, he said, May not the Laba Sakkara, Laba Sakkara means the gain and the praise, uh, disturb my mind. Then the attendant kept on saying, no, you have already eradicated defilement. So, so it's not an issue. It's unlike a Putujjana person, you are not going to be affected by these, these offerings. But still he said, no, I, let, may it not disturb my mind. And he said, uh, the Buddha, Buddhas appear into the world, uh, like after a long time, you are very rare. It's very seldom that Buddhas appear. So, in such occasion, let, let, may you, may the Buddha, the Blessed One, uh, give an opportunity for the people to accumulate this merit by offering. So, you, you, may, not, you may not be uh, of, of need of these requisites, but give them at least an opportunity to offer them. He said, no, still not. He rejected it. So, this is the, uh, is a very, very uh, significant sutta for monks, showing that the Buddha rest rejected the offerings that were going to be made. And it gave us, especially the monks, uh, a, a very good sign that how did the Buddha treat these Laba Sakkara. Laba Sakkara are the gain and the respect that we get from other people. Although the Buddha did not ask for respect or veneration, he would accept them from pious devotees along with their offerings. Therefore, beings with faith who recognized the Buddha's supreme qualities paid respect and made offerings to him both while he was alive and after the attainment attained, after he had attained Parnibbana. So, Mahatera's answer is no, Buddha had made not, had, did not make any such request or rule of making, uh, uh, making Buddha statues. If you have any questions, you can ask it in the uh, Q&A session after I have given the clarifications. Then, the second question. How can one pay respect and venerate the Buddha who has attained Parnibbana? This is another question. How could we pay respect to a person who has died or the Buddha who has attained Parnibbana? Because now uh, a, a non-Arahant, after dying, he would be born in some other place. But an Arahant has no rebirth and his Namarupa process has completely ex 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 extinguished. So, there is no remnants of Nama Rupa in any realm remaining uh, related to him. A remnants means he's not, he's not been born again. Right? His body parts may remain, but uh, his life is not continuing anymore. And uh, that because uh, by, the, by the attainment of Arahanship, he eradicates the possibilities of a rebirth. So how could we make veneration to a person who has already died or who has already attained Parnibbana? So this is a thing that first we need to clarify. So in order to understand why Buddha statues are relevant, why it is okay to pay respect to Buddha statues, uh, first we know to know, first we should know what is the process going in our minds while we pay respect to someone who has already passed away. Now our minds, 
Now, for example, this, if we take this as the mind, chitta and chetasikas are also there. Chetasikas. This chitta always, according to Buddhist philosophy, chitta arises always taking an object. This is the object, for example. This I may write as consciousness. Always the mind focuses as at an object. In Western philosophy, we call this intentionality. It's a very, very technical term. Some philosophers believe that not every conscious, every con uh, all the consciousness do not need an object. For example, moods are not related to any object according to them. But some philosophers think that every consciousness, all the time, consciousness is related to a certain object. That's called the intentionality in philosophy. There's nothing related with the intention in that term. Buddhism falls into this category because we believe every consciousness has an object. Consciousness cannot arise without taking object as if a feeble man cannot stand up on its own, on his, on his own uh, without the help of a stick. So every consciousness has an object. This object could be of three periods. It could be a past one, it could be a present one, it even could be a future one. Even could be a future one. And also we should know this object is felt to the mind in a certain way. This object is felt to the mind. The way, way it is felt is called the chitta nimitta. Nimitta. These words are given in some sub-commentaries. And sometimes it's referred to as akara. Akara, the way the object is taken by the mind. The way the object is taken by the mind. Sometimes they may differ. They may differ. For example, we may have a misunderstanding about someone who is coming towards us. We may think he's our friend while an unknown person is coming. And also we have misperceptions. Now, according to Buddha's teachings, the actual objects in the outside world are non-self. They, they don't have any self. But we take them as a self. They are normally impermanent, but sometimes we take them as permanent, or at least to be permanent to a certain, certain amount of time. So we have wrong perceptions. While, while they, they beget suffering, they cause suffering, we take them as blissful. So all the wrong perceptions, these are the wrong percep perceptions. I mean, this is not a chetasika, this is not the sanya. This is the idea of them, how the object is taken, is being taken, how the object is considered. Sometimes in vipassana meditation, we take it as it is. While the, uh, when the out objects of the reality are non-self, we take them as non-self. As objects of realities are impermanent, we take them as impermanent. While they are, uh, uh, as they are uh, suffering or they cause suffering, we take them as something causing suffering. So in Vipassana meditation, we try to match these two. So we, are, we try to live according to the reality. But in other occasions, we have certain uh, opinions or sometimes most of, most of the times we have uh, different opinions to that of the reality. So normally Panyati, the object of Panyati comes here. But sometimes the, it can be a paramatta nimitta as well if you are taking the object as it is. Okay, we'll, I'm not going into detail to talk about this because this is not an Abhidhamma lesson. So what happens is this chitta has the capacity to take an object that is actually present, that is obviously, that is obvious to us. It is able to take an object that is actually present. But it is also possible according to Buddhist teachings, a chitta can take a past and a future object. What is a past object? Past doesn't refer to the time here. It's referred to the object itself. Past, present, future in Pali, though, it's, though in English it refers to a time, an abstract concept, which is called time. Here, past, present, future, in terms of Buddhist philosophy, refers to things that were in certain periods. According to Buddhism, time doesn't exist. Time is something that is felt to the mind and it's not an ultimate entity or a reality. Even some, some philosophers, Western philosophers, think there is nothing, some, nothing called, there is nothing called time. Uh, it's something that is created by mind. But some physicians, most of the physicians, physics, physics believe time as, a, as the fourth dimension. Okay, that's, we'll, 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 we're not going to talk about the 
idea of time here. I'm just going to explain what the Buddhism, what Buddhism says, Theravada Buddhism says. Time is just a concept uh, created in the mind or happened to be felt with by the mind, seen the processes, how the mind and matter works, seen these processes, taking the two points of, the say, of a certain process and we get the idea of time. The time is a concept according to Theravada teachings. So, but still, uh, then the realities are termed as past, present, future. What is the definition? If a reality has arisen and passed away, it has arisen, it was not there before, it was there, it passed away and no more. If a certain reality has already passed away, that is a past reality. If something has passed away, P-A-S-S-E-D, passed away, then that reality is a past reality. Then present means something that has arisen but haven't passed away yet. It's existing but not passed away yet. Has not passed away yet. Then what is a future reality? Future reality is something that has not arisen. That has not arisen yet. So the mind is capable of taking these two objects as well. Taking the present is obvious, it's, it's clear. It's clear means most of the way. You can still argue on this, how, how is the mind capable of going into this a different realm of rupas or namas and why, what is that capacity of cognition and so forth. These are very abstract topics that, we, uh, that are beyond our scope in, the, in this lesson. Uh, past and future. How could the mind take past and future? I also would like to remind that these, this idea of knowing the past and future led to the, led to the emergence of a different Buddhist, a separate Buddhist sect called Sarvastivadins. Sarvastivadins, Sarva Asti, Sarva means all, Asti means existing. So they considered, since it is very obvious that we can know the past, future and the present, all three time, all three realities pertaining into all three times, so they came to the idea, if past can be known, that past must be existing in a certain form. It may not be visible to us as the present. It is not obvious to us as present. But since it is existing in one way or another, that's, on, that's why we are capable of knowing the past. And sometimes we do see future with psychic powers and also in dreams sometimes. So, if future can be felt or future can be known, on rare occasions at least, it means future is also existing in a, some form. So, what happens is the realities, they go through the time, when they come to the present, they manifest in a way that, is, that can be felt with our ordinary senses, like, like the five senses and so forth. But when they pass away, they are still existing in a certain form. So sometimes they can be known or recalled by our minds uh, in the speed, the sixth sense of the mind. So, but the Theravadians, they have argued on this in the Katavattu. They have said, no, past and future doesn't exist according to Buddha's teachings. Because Buddha has said, yadati tang pahinantang, what is past is completely gone, it has vanished. Appattancha anagatan, the future has not come. So past and future should not be existing in one, in what way, uh, in any of the ways. That's, that's, that, that was their argument. But Theravadins haven't given a, uh, uh, given a specific way or specific uh, reason why Chitta could take past and, past and future. It seems like that uh, they have taken it as a capacity of the Chitta. They have, the Chitta has the attribute, has the capacity uh, to know a reality that has already vanished and also to know something that is about to arise in some cases. So anyway, so Chitta has the capacity, according to Theravada, Chitta has the capacity to know something which has already passed away, something which has already passed away. So then there are few ways of cognition, few ways of cognition. For example, uh, when we are seeing something with our eyes, this is a direct experience. It's a direct experience and we don't need any evidences to prove it as well. For example, if I'm seeing something, that's self-evident. You don't need uh, any proof for that. According to skeptics, this cannot be proven. 
because they have, in the end you go into circular argument. I am not going to talk about that. Uh, according to skeptics, you cannot prove it with evidences even while you are experiencing something uh, with your senses at the present moment. Uh, but normally we take it for granted and we would normally say while we are now for example you are looking at this lecture through your zoom or whatever whatever uh, device that you are using uh, so you are you are self evident about it we take we take it as a exact experience that we are having and that experience is very very clear and vivid and also we can recall something that we experience in our past for example sometimes we'll be able to recall something some incident which happened few minutes ago or something that happened few months ago, sometimes few days ago, few years ago. You will not be able to recall everything, but certain, at least certain incidents that, that, that uh, our mind can uh, recall or catch. Now, so that is also self-evident. I myself or the person knows there is something called false memory. Yeah, that's, a, that's something that can happen, but in most of the cases, we know that we, if we have, we can recall something that happens to us. So that's why we can even give this as evidence in quotes that I experienced, or I did this, I saw this, and so forth. So these are the direct experiences that we have. Now think about, recall, think, think about this scenario. Thinking about, thinking about something that is not yet at your presence. For instance, if most of you have seen the Mahacheti in Anuradhapura or think about Shredagon Pagoda or whatever, which is, which is not in front of you at the moment. If you think about it at the moment, if you think about it at the moment, surely a certain picture would appear in your mind. You will see a certain picture in most of the cases, uh, resembling to what you have seen in a picture or, what, or, the, or the last time you saw it. If you are recalling your experience, how you saw it last time, that's a different case because that is something of your first-hand experience that you are recalling what you have seen, what you experienced. That's a different case. I'm talking about thinking about the Mahacheti at this moment. I won't just want to pay respect to Mahacheti. So I think about Mahacheti and pay respect to that. So according to Theravada teaching, that's the point here. My mind is taking the present Mahacheti that is existing at this moment. My object is the present Mahacheti, present Shredogon Pagoda. It may be felt as something that you have seen. So it may be felt, it, it was known to the mind through an object that you have seen, but the actual object is the present object that is over there. The present object. So I'll repeat again, if I'm paying respect to Mahacheti from here, even though its color has changed, for example, you know its color has changed, I recall it, I, I pay respect to it, and obviously I will feel it as white while the color has changed actually. So according to Theravada teachings, my object of reference, the actual object is the Mahacheti which is present. But we may, I may think about it in a way that I have seen it, maybe in a picture or maybe with your first hand experience. When it comes to karma, what matters is this, not this. I will give an, another example for this. For, for instance, I am telling about a monk whom I met in Burma, someone whom you have not seen, and I start to accuse him or criticize him and then you also join with me and criticize the person and obviously when I am relating the story to you a certain image may appear in your mind and because you will be also having a mental image while I am talking about uh, this story and you will also for example I am telling something that person a bad thing that the person has done or something that I doubted. Hmm? So then what happened, now you had an image, for example, when I say about Burmese monk, you had a certain image of a white monk or a, or a certain, certain appearance of Burmese and so forth. And uh, next day, unfortunately, I found out that the person has already attained arahanship and we were accusing, we have accused, uh, while the time we, we were accusing, few days ago, few months ago, he has attained arahanship and I had a 
complete misperception about his behavior. So I come and tell, or oh, very something serious has happened. We both have accused, okay, think that both of us have said him the fool. So we have said those words. So we have we have said the words fool. So I would say that was a great mistake. That person was an arahant, and I had a misunderstanding. So, so then. We, I would feel like I have accused an arahant and I, 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 I do an apology to him. Because I have to pay, a, 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 I have to ask for apologies. Because otherwise it's going to uh, create a huge problem in my, for my sansaric uh, lives. Then I show an actual picture of the person to you. Now imagine you had a certain picture while I was relating about a white uh, fair color monk. But this monk happens to be a, a, a traditional Burmese person who is quite a little bit darker and which, is, which has no resemblance with your image at all. The person whom you thought was different and the person I am showing is completely different because you had a different mind image from my, what I did because when I am talking about a story, always now think about the uh, expenditure or ex, uh, expeditions made by the Emperor Alexander, we would, always, we would all have different images going through our minds, right? Based on our experiences when we are listening to such a story. Now, that person had a certain mental image while it, when it was not, not resembling to the actual person. So when I, when I showed him the actual photo, he would say, oh, come on. I had a person of a fair color. I had an image of a fair color person. And you are showing someone who is a darker person than this. So that is the person I accuse, not this person. If you bring such an argument, what would be the answer? I would say no. You cannot get rid of that like that. You cannot get rid of the comma like that. Because both of us were referring to the same person. You, were refer you, were, you, told, you told him a fool to whom I was referring. So we were both in the same discussion and we were accusing the same person. It was not a misunderstanding. For example, if I, if I misspelled a noun, or misspelled a name, or if you have understood someone else, for example, you thought that is this person, and while I was telling a different person, then there is a mismatch. But we had no, you have no idea about how, whom I was talking, and I was referring to a particular person, and you had no misunderstanding about different person, so you are referring to that same person with your mind, but with a different mental image. Different because my mental image was mostly resembling the person because I have seen him, but you had a different mental image. If you start to say no, my mental image was different from from whom you are showing, so I have not not accumulated aryopoa though accusing an arahan. No, you will not be free from that. What is the reason? You were having we both of us were having the same object of reference. This is the object of reference. This is the mental image. So when it comes to the karmas, what matters is the ment object of reference, not the mental image. Even you have taken it with a different mental image, as long as you are referring to the same object of reference or object, then the karma, we are accumulating the karma based on the natures of this object. So that's what happens with the present objects. Now think about a past person. Now we all believe that the Buddha existed and there are historical evidences also that he existed and he was born in Nepal and in, in, he lived in India, not obviously not in Sri Lanka as some, some would say and uh, so he, he is a person who actually lived. So there was a Buddha. I have read, a, I have listened to an article that some one person was arguing Buddha was a myth, mythical, mythical story but it does not have much ground. Obviously, there was a person whom we call the Buddha and there are lots of ev evidences for that as well. So, so we know now we are referring to the Buddha. None of us have seen the Buddha. We don't know actual, his actual appearance. We have just listened to words written in books and none of us have witnessed him. Maybe in Sansara we have witnessed, but now none of us recall, none of us remember. We cannot imagine actually, but when we refer to the Buddha, he appears to our mind in a way, in most of the cases, the mental image would resemble to a Buddha statue 
which we adore or which we like most. Normally, the Buddha statue we like the most comes to our mind. So, through that image, we are referring to the actual Buddha. Now, someone, for example, someone accuses the Buddha with bad words. Then, we say, go and ask for apology from the Buddha or take apology, uh, ask for apologies because you have accused the Buddha. Then he would say, no, I remember the Buddha or I recall the Buddha or when I was accusing him. What came to my mind was a Buddha statue whom I pay respect to or whom I, what, uh, something which I have seen. And this Buddha statue is never going to be the same with the actual Buddha. He is different to the object of, of mental object. If he starts to argue with us he, that he has not accumulated any demerit by accusing the actual Buddha, because his argument is his mental image is not going to match with the actual Buddha who lived 2,500 years ago, we would dismiss his argument saying, no, you were referring to the actual Buddha who existed. Even though the, his Nama Rupas have passed away, they did exist 2,500 years ago in India. They did exist. So therefore, our mind was having the actual reference of the Buddha. So this is how, if Akusalas can be accumulated by accusing the Buddha, while, even while we have not seen him actually, we are contemplating him based on the pictures that we have seen, which are drawn by artists or made by uh, sculptors. So what uh, we are not actually seeing him, but we, so we cannot get rid of the demerit. In the same way, if we pay respect to the Buddha who has passed away, our mind, we may be thinking about him based on an image that we have gathered or accumulated through our experiences, but we are referring to the actual Buddha. Therefore, referring or paying respect to the actual Buddha who has passed away, we can accumulate great merit. So that's how, that's the Abhidhamma behind this. That's how the mind works behind this. So this, when we are paying respect to, respect to the actual Mahacheti or Shredagon Pagoda, or whatever mon monument at present, our object of reference is that actual object, that actual uh, monument we are paying respect at. It may appear to us in a way that we have seen it before or a picture that we, that is we are familiar with, but still our object of reference is the actual object that is existing at this moment. In the same way, when you are paying respect to someone who is past, who has passed away, we have our object of reference was those mind and matter that existed. And those were the Buddhas when it, when it comes to paying respect to the Buddha. So we get the merit of paying respect to a Buddha. So that's why it is mentioned in uh, Theravada tradition. If you can have the, the, the there's a difference, but when, when we normally actually, when we, if we happen to meet the Buddha in person, in, in, in person then the feelings would be different. Normally when we think about him, we, it's very difficult to have that same feeling as if we have seen the Buddha uh, in person. So, but if we are capable of having that similar feeling, we are able to get a similar result. That's how it's been explained in Theravada teachings. So that's how the mechanism, that is the mechanism behind paying respect to someone who is not existing. Then someone can ask the question about future. When it comes to future, things get complicated. I'm not going to touch upon that because even I myself will not be able to give you definitive answers when it comes to uh, certain objects about the future. So we'll just not touch upon that. Uh, so how can one pay respect and veneration to the Buddha who has attained Parinibbana? This is the this is what this is the mechanism, Abhidhammic mechanism behind such veneration. It is customary for, customary for civilized humans. Now, now Mahathira is talking about uh, some, uh, rich, some, some practical ways that this has, been, this has been done. It is customary for civilized humans to respect virtuous people who have passed away. To honor these virtuous individuals, people often establish 
gravestones, monuments and statues and pay respect to these memorials, sometimes offering flower bouquets. Similarly, pious Buddhists show respect to the Buddha who has attained Parinibbana through these same practices. What is the practice? They make statues, they make gravestones, they make memorials and pay respect by offering flowers and so forth. That's done normally in our, in our society. So Buddhists also follow the same practice. Monuments, statues and structures created in, in honor of noble beings such as the Buddha are called Chetiya. Chetiya, this is a Pali word that you should know. Chetiya are the things, uh, structures that are created to honor beings like the Buddha and so forth. These memorials are not made because the virtuous ones have asked for them. That's also something we discussed in the previous, previous question. So he's also elaborating some, some, some other some facts related to that. For example, the statue of Mahatma Gandhi was not made in his at his request. No, was the statue of Vihara Mahadevi in Vihara Mahadevi Park in Sri Lanka. The Sri Lankans may know that because this Vihara Mahadevi is the mother of King Duttagamini. And then Mahatera keeps on uh, goes for, uh, 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 continues. Likewise, the statues of Anagarika Dharmapala or Prime Minister D.S. Senanayaka of Sri Lanka were not created because they requested or ordered them. In the same way, Buddhists make statues of the Buddha not because he requested or ordered them to do so. However, this custom of creating memorials for various individuals and paying respect to them was not rejected by the Buddha. Rather, it was accepted by him. He accepted this custom. He didn't, he accepted means he said that uh, uh, a Buddha, a Pacheka Buddha, Arahant and a Chakravati deserves a Chetya, deserves such memorials. He didn't talk about creating Buddha statues, but Chetyas, yes. Stupas, memorials, pagodas can be made. Tuparaha Pugala. He, he appreciated this. He didn't request to make anything for him, but he requested this custom. He, he acknowledged this custom. Threefold Chetya. In those days, people who had faith in the Buddha and respected him would visit Jetavana Rama to honor him. However, when Buddha was traveling to different regions to preach Dhamma, these various visitors would leave flowers and aromatic offerings in front of his kuti and then return home without experiencing much joy from the offerings. Because Buddha didn't stay in one place. Uh, he, he used to travel in various districts and countries preaching the Dhamma which he found, which he founded. So the people in Savatthi used to visit this Jetavana Monas because that's the, that was his uh, base location where he used to stay the most of, most of the time. So people used to visit him in Jetavana but sometimes when he had gone for traveling or, or to preach Dhamma, uh, they, they, normally they bring flowers and aromatic uh, stuff to offer him. So on such occasions, they found that the Buddha is missing. So what they did was they kept it in front of his Gandakuti. Gandakuti means his kuti, his, uh, his uh, residence and went back. And they didn't find much pleasure in it. Uh, the rich man Anand Pindika saw this issue. So when Venerable Ananda and the Buddha had returned, he approached Venerable Ananda and asked, is, is it possible that we could establish a certain structure in Jetavana on behalf of Buddha so people could at least pay respect to and they will have some feeling that they have paid respect to the Buddha. So that was the request Anatha Pindika was making. So that's, 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 that's the story uh, Mahatera has written also. Uh, recognizing this, the wealthy Anatha Pindika approached Venerable Ananda, uh, approached Venerable Ananda when the Buddha had returned to the Jetavana monastery and said, Venerable Sir, when the Tathagata is away, this monastery becomes a place without refuge for those who come here. There is no place for the devotees to offer the flowers and aromatic items they bring. Please convey this to the Tathagata and ask if it is possible to establish a respectable monument here. Then when Ananda, accepting Anath Pindika's request, approached the Buddha and asked, instead of asking, shall we establish a memorial or a, or a, or a, a respectable monument, he just went and asked, this is a venerable sir, how many types of Chetiyas are there? The blessed one, how many types of Chetiyas are there? The Buddha replied, Ananda, there are three types of Chetiyas. Three types of Chetiyas. Venerable Ananda further inquired, what are they, Venerable Sir? The Buddha explained, Ananda, Ananda, the three types of Chetiyas are called Saririka. Saririka. Paribhogika. 
and Uddesika. These are the three. Saririka, Paribhogika and Uddesika. Saririka. So I'll, I'll explain them later. Right? Uh, to give a brief introduction, Saririka are the body parts of the Buddha. Parts of the body. Paribhogika is something used by the Buddha. It can be his robe or the beds or chairs that were used by him, his, his kuti, residence, and also the bodhi tree under, under which he spent one week uh, after the enlightenment and also under which he got the enlightenment, attained the enlightenment. Uddesika are the remaining structures that can be structures or pictures, whatever sign that can be used in terms of like re, uh, referring to the Buddha. Referring to the Buddha. It could be a depic depicting or a picture or it can be some other sign which doesn't contain or some other object which doesn't contain body parts or something that he has used. Okay, we'll come to that explanation. And he said there are three. Venerable Ananda then asked, Venerable Sir, is it possible to make chetiyas while you are alive? The Buddha clarified, Ananda, it is not possible to create sari reka chetya while the Tathagata is alive. This can only be done after Tathagata has attained Parnibbana because you cannot ex extract body parts from his body while he is alive, obviously. But there is a one uh, sari reka body part that, uh, that could be taken and paid respect while he was alive, that those are the hair relics, hair relics. So according to the story of uh, which is which we find in the Mahavagga Pali, uh, when the Tapasu and Ballikas made the request after after going for refuge under the Buddha and Dhamma, so they said, uh, is, there a, is there something uh, a respectable object that we can have so we, we can pay respect uh, instead of because we will not be able to meet you again. Uh, so is there a thing that we can pay respect at? Then he uh, rubbed his hair and gave eight strings of hair. Later on, the, both of them visited back Buddha and one became a monk and attained Arahanship and one attained Sotapanna Hood. And the Myanmar, is, Myanmar, people, Myanmar people believe that uh, both of them came to Myanmar and those uh, really, uh, hair relics are enshrined in the great Shwedagon Pagoda. In Sri Lanka, the history says, uh, they came to, uh, uh, to the uh, eastern region and uh, they built the stupa in enshrining eight relics in which is called Girihandu Sai. So there are different stories behind them, behind this incident. So anyway, and also in Sri Lankan Chronicles, we have a story of Buddha giving some hair relics to, to a divine being called Sumana Saman. That is actually Sumana Devaraja. In Sinhalese, we call Sumana Saman. Sumana and Saman are the same words. Sumana is uh, uh, the Pali word, while Saman is the Sinhalese word. So Sumana Devaraja, he offered them to the Sumana, and he built the Mayangana Stupa in Sri Lanka, enshrining the eight, uh, enshrining some hair relics. So anyway, uh, there is an incident of in the, in the Tipitaka. It is mentioned that he gave the hair relics to uh, the Tapasu and Baldikas. So normally he was he was actually referring to the bones and so actually he was referring to the bones. So, so you cannot take extract bones uh, from his body while he's alive. The Uddesika Chetya does not contain either Saririka or Paribhogika objects. Uddesika Chetya is just a monument or an object that doesn't contain any body parts or something that he has used. A monument becomes a Uddesika Chetya simply by being honored with devout mind. Okay. By considering if this is a Uddesika, for example, if this is a kind of kind of a monument, if we think, if we think as this resembles or this refers to the Buddha, if my mind, if I start to respect this as the Buddha, for example, this as a sign of referring to the Buddha, then this becomes Uddesika. But if that Uddesika contains some relics or an object that he used, then this becomes Saririka and Paribhogika accordingly, right? So for example, think about a pagoda, a stupa that we make. This is just a monument. This is just a monument. In, in, in Myanmar, we have this kind of pagodas, right? So these are just monuments. They have no specific value in veneration, receiving, because they are just made out of bricks. 
Our houses are made out of bricks. Those, these pagodas are made out of bricks. So why they become so sacred? One reason, if you enshrine the relics, then they become sari rika They are enshrining or they are covering certain relics. So we are paying, pay, paying respect to the relics actually. The, with the, uh, the stupa with the relic chamber. If you have en enshrined, for example, uh, according to the chronicles of Sri Lanka, there is a stupa in which the Buddha's belt is enshrined. Buddha's patra is the, the ball is been enshrined. So things that he used, so they become paribogi kachetiyas. But if there is, if someone is unable to find relics, these monuments are just monuments. But if the person starts to respect it as, as, as if respecting the Buddha and consider these as the Buddha, then this becomes Uddesika. So that is what is mentioned here. A monument becomes an Uddesika Chetya simply by being honored with a devout mind. Okay, if we start to respect a certain monument and consider it as the Buddha, then it becomes an Uddesika Chetya. The Mahabodhi tree under which the Tathagata sat is considered the Paribogika Chetya. It's on not only the Paribogika Chetya, it's not the only Paribogika Chetya. Uh, his chairs, uh, beds, robes, all are Paribogika Chetyas, anything that he has used. Uh, both by, so it is considered a Paribogika Chetya, the Bodhi tree, both while the Tathagata is alive and even after he has attained Parnibbana. Both while he is alive and he has attained the Parnibbana. So you cannot have Saririka Chetya, he said you cannot have Saririka Chetya while I am alive and Uddesika Chetya is something that doesn't contain Paribogika or Sari Chetya, Charika Datus and Paribogika is the Bodhi tree under which he sat and there are any other object that he has used. This story is not mentioned in the Tipitaka but can be found in the background story of the Kalinga Bodhi Jataka in the commentary. The following are the Pali sentences mentioned in the Jataka. Ananda, Sari Rikanna Sakka Katong, it's not possible to make Sari Rika Chetiyas while I'm alive. Tanji Buddha Nang Parinibbana Kale Hoti. After the Parinibbana, you can have Saririka Chetiyas. Uddesikang, Avattukang. Uddesika doesn't contain Avattukang, not Avattu, Avattukang. It doesn't contain either Saririka or Paribogika objects. Mamayana Matta Meva Hoti is just a consider. it's just by the consideration, by the consideration that these are, uh, these resembles Buddha, they, they refer to Buddha, then they become Uddesika. Buddhehi Parimbuto. Uh, pari buddha hi pari buddho used by the buddhas maha uh, baha bodhi rukho buddhesu darante supi chetiya meva uh, buddhesu darante supi chetiya meva so the bodhi rukha the bodhi tree even while the buddha is alive becomes a, a pari bogika chetiya the phrase now he is referring to how could one pay respect to the buddha so we can pay respect to a Buddha in to, to these three things. That's what he's mentioning. Even at the absence of these three, still you can pay respect to the Buddha. But normally, they gives us some kind of a feeling uh, that we are paying respect to the Buddha. So, so having such monuments are very valuable because we can get the idea of the Buddha by respecting such physical objects. So relics, these are the relics. These are the Bodhi tree or any other object that he used. Then Uddesika are the monuments that doesn't contain relics or anything that he has used. So there was an argument on those days when the Mahatera was alive. Uh, they some considered, now Uddesika are there. Now these Uddesikas are the ones who doesn't contain relics or something that the Buddha has used. Now think about the Buddha statue. Buddha statue is a Uddesika Chetya. It doesn't contain relics normally. Now, Pagodas without, without relics are Uddesika Chetiyas. So normally these are, and sometimes in ancient days, olden days, they used to draw Buddha statues. Um, instead of Buddha statues, sorry, they used to uh, depict the Buddha in the, in the sign of a Dhamma Chakka, wheel of Dhamma. Sometimes Buddha's chair was drawn. They were afraid to draw the Buddha's figure because uh, it, it, it may, it may be they have, they, they must have considered as a disrespect because we are, we are unable to draw his figure as it is. I right? will always draw something 
uh, inferior to his actual figure. So it makes sense. And these days we draw the Buddha's, the Buddha's picture. So these are all Uddesikas because they don't contain Sari Riko Paribogika Chetiyas. So what happens is some argued that there is no such a thing called Uddesika Chetiya in the, in the, in the literature. Uh, it, it cannot be referring to a, a, a Buddha statue or a physical object. It's just the consideration itself. Just the contemplation of the Buddha's attributes is the, Buddha, uh, is the Uddesika Chetya. That was their argument. So we'll look into this argument. The phrase Uddesikang Avattukang Mamayana Matta Mevo Hoti can be challenging to understand. There has been some debate over whether it is appropriate to pay respect to Buddha statues based on this statement. When investigating the meaning of such brief statements, it is important to look at the background story. Additionally, one should examine how the same concept is explained in commentaries, sub-commentaries and other literary sources of the tradition. It is also essential to consider how ancient teachers of the tradition have approached this matter. So we have to uh, look at the background story, how this thing is being discussed in other books, in commentaries, sub-commentaries and other sources of literature and how the tradition has dealt with this. That is also a very important point. If one tries to interpret such sentence at face value, it means like just looking at the uh, meaning uh, shallowly without going into the, uh, go, without having a thorough investigation. The actual meaning might be missed. Some who misinterpret this sentence argue that an Uddesika Chetya is not a separate physical object, but rather a mere contemplation of the Buddha's attributes. However, interpreting the sentence this way contradicts the background story. Vendabal Ananda asked the Buddha about the Chetyas because According to the background story, when Ananda asked the Chetya about the Chetyas with the intention of providing a physical Chetya for devotees visiting Jetavana Rama to worship. So that was his purpose. So he was asking Chetyas about a monument or physical object that we can keep in Jetavana. So people could, so, uh, so when Ananda came and asked the question, what can we establish in Jetavana monastery at your absence? So, so he was asking for a monument. So therefore, saying that Uddesika is just the mere contemplation of the Buddha's attributes doesn't make sense. Right? Ananda asked the Buddha about a Chetya with the intention of providing a physical Chetya for devotees visiting Jetavana Rama to worship. If someone is asked about an object of worship and responds by mentioning something that is not a physical object, it would be, asked, it would, it would be akin to saying, this is a Sinhalese phrase that Mahathir has given, I have coconut in my bag. When asked, where are you going? We say, in Kohedi Malipol. So, what he is asking, where are you going? He says, what is in your bag? So, it, it is, the answer is irrelevant to the question. So, such an answer is irrelevant and without substance, without any essence. The Buddha, being a wise teacher, would not have provided an answer that lacked essence, lacks essence. If an Uddesika Chetya were mere, merely the contemplation of Buddha's qualities and not a physical object, that could be worshipped, the Buddha would have only mentioned the Saririk and Paribogika Chetyas in his answer and not and omit any reference to an, an Uddesika Chetya. Because if Uddesika Chetya is just a mere contemplation, there is no purpose of saying or naming it as a Chetya. The fact that he included an Uddesika Chetya shows that it is a physical object that can be venerated. Therefore, interpreting an Uddesika Chetya as something non-physical contradicts the background story. Then he goes to the definition of Chetya. This is also very important. The term Chetya is defined in the commentary on the Nidhikanda Suddha as follows. Chai tabban Chetyang, Puje tabban ti uttang hoti. This means that the Chetya is something that should be respected or honored. Something, some physical thing. Uh, it is not possible to call something that is not an object, not a physical object, uh, object of veneration, a chetya. If it is not a physical thing, you cannot call it a chetya, uh, object of veneration. Mere contemplation of the Buddha's attributes, which cannot be presented as something to be worshipped, cannot be a chetya. Considering Uddesika chetya as non-physical does not align with the definition of this word chetya. Obviously, it does not align with the uh, definition as well. It says something that can be respected because mere contemplation is not a thing that can be respected. 
The term matches its definition only when the Ujjayasika Chetya is considered a physical object. The following is how the three types of Chetyas are defined in the commentary of the Nidhikanda Sutta. Tampanetang Chetyang Tividang Hoti. I'll, I'll, I'll go to the translation. I have given the translation actually. Pariboga Chetyang, Uddesika Chetyang, Uddisaka Chetyang, Datu Chetyanti, Tatta Bodhirukko Pariboga Chetyang, Buddha pa Buddha patima udesika chetiyang datu gabba thupa uh, sadatuka datuka datuk uh, datuka chetiyang. So this is how it's been uh, translated. Chetiya is threefold as pari pariboga chetiya, udisaka chetiya, and datu chetiya. Out of them, the bodhi tree is the pariboga chetiya. A Buddha statue is an udesika chetiya. Stupas that have a relic chamber enshrined with relics is a saririka chetiya. The phrase Buddha Patima Uddesika Chetiyang clearly indicates that a Buddha statue is an Uddesika Chetiya. This is how the commentators have explained this. Both the Jataka commentary and the Kuddaka Pata commentary were written by the same author who would not contradict himself by presenting different information in different places. Since the Kuddaka Pata commentary explicitly states that a Buddha statue is an Uddesika Chetiya, the phrase Uddesikang Avattukang must be understood to mean that an Uddesika Chetiya is a physical object that can be worshipped. So Uddesika Chetiya is a physical object that doesn't contain relics or anything that the Buddha has used. The phrase Uddesikang Avattukang signifies that there is no Saririka or Paribogika object within an Uddesika Chetiya. If an Uddesika Chetiya were not a physical object, the Pali term would be Uddesikang Avattu, not Avattukang, Avattu rather than Uddesikang Avattukang. So the ones who know Pali understand this meaning. If Uddesika Chetiya was not a physical object, the Pali would be Uddesikang Avattu, uh, uh, neuter gender nominative case, uh, referring to a non-physical object. But Uddesikang Avattukang means it is an object that doesn't contain any of the Vattu. What are the Vattus? Relics or Paribogika objects. It's a Bahubihi Samasa. An object becomes a sari rikam. Now this is the point. This is another, another important point. The object an object becomes a sari rika chetya by being a part of the Buddha's body, obviously. It becomes a paribogika chetya by being an item used by the Buddha. An object is regarded as an uddesika chetya when it is respected and honored as representing the Buddha's body or related attributes. If we consider this as, for example, a Buddha statue, for instance, For example, this is a Buddha statue, we consider this uh, is, by considering that this is the Buddha, we, we becomes a Uddesika Chetya. This idea is conveyed through the phrase Mamayana Mattameva, which emphasizes the significance of consideration and respect. By respecting or considering it as a Buddha statue, a Buddha's thing, something resembling the Buddha, it becomes an Uddesika Chetya. It is unreasonable to believe that mere consideration with respect constitutes a chetya. Mere consideration is a mental activity. It cannot be a chetya actually. Such an interpretation would lead to confusion. If Mamayana Meva, Mamayana were considered a chetya, paying respect to the chetya would mean paying respect to one's own mind. This interpretation is clearly not practical because if you consider Uddesika Chetya is your own consideration, how could one pay respect? Because Chetya is something that could be respected. So you are respecting, you should be respecting your own mind. So it doesn't make sense. To pay respect to the Buddha who has attained Parinibbara, one must honor either a Saririka Chetya, Paribogika Chetya or an Uddesika Chetya. By doing so, the Buddha is respected. If none of these Chetyas are available, it is still appropriate to pay respect to the Buddha at any place. You just can pay respect thinking about him. Merits can be accumulated by paying respect to the Buddha even in the absence of a physical chetya. Because now, you, because of this formula, this process, you can pay respect to the Buddha even at the absence of a chetya. Chetya means even at the absence of a Buddha statue. But in the next, next questions, we will talk about uh, how, why it is important, what is the importance of a Buddha statue. And 
what are the other things that can be a Uddesi Kachetya and why do we pay respect to Buddha statues? Because it gives us that feeling that's very useful to us. That was the main reason that we uh, must pay respect to Buddha statue and it is a very good assistance for us to get the idea of the Buddha into our mind. So that will uh, empower or uh, strengthen our uh, kusala and gives us, a, gives us great results. And also, we'll be, there will be some interesting topics. Why did he uh, chose to plant a Bodhi tree instead of some other object uh, in the, in the, in the uh, Jetavana Vihara? Uh, so, so, why did Buddha, didn't Buddha make, may, may, uh, instruct to make a statue? Someone could, can ask the question. So, sometimes there are misinterpretations about certain words. So, when did this uh, tradition of uh, making statues began? Did all the ancient teachers unanimously agreed on this statue worshipping? By respecting which, which chetya, paying which chetya is more, one can gain more benefits. Do the actual relics of the Buddha play? How do we uh, recognize Buddha's relics? Is there, do they show merits, uh, miracles and so forth? And in, in future lessons, we'll also be discussing how to make a Sangika Dana. Can a Sangika Dana be made in front of few monks? Do we need a specific number of monks? And what to do with the Sangika Dana after you have finished the Sangika Dana? Because after monks have left, so how to deal with this food? To whom it belongs to? So all these, most of these questions have been asked. So if someone pays respect to Devas, for example, deities, do they lose their uh, Buddhist hood? or disciplehood by merely paying respect to devas and so forth. So these kind of very interesting topics. So how, how to deal with astrology in Buddhism? How do we, how do we manage it? Is, is it in align with the Buddha's teachings or not? And all many of these questions will be discussed and it will be an interesting journey that we'll be uh, threading upon. And, uh, and hope uh, you, understood, you enjoy the class. And we talked two, two questions. Did the Buddha make a rule or request that his disciples must make Buddha statues of him and worship them? Obviously not. Obviously not. Then how can one respect and venerate to Buddha who has attained Parinibbana? Right? So this is, the, this is the mechanism behind it, the Abhidhamma explanation. And then there are three objects, Saririka, Paribogika and Uddesika. And Mahathera was referring to an argument that was existing of his time that Uddesika Chetiya is a Buddha statue. So the Buddha statues or any monument that resembles the Buddha is, is, is uh, uh, allowed to be respected. So we are not just respecting the, 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 the clay or the material out of which it is made because in the next question we will discuss how uh, uh, Thera was able to, in one of his past lives, pay respect to a heap of sand that was made like a stupa and, and how he could gain the great merit of attaining Arahan Pandey. So, uh, yes, I conclude the lecture. So, today we discuss only two questions. Uh, we have 98 questions to discuss and uh, hope it will be, in some days we will be able to cover 5-6 questions because the second question, the answer was quite long. And I also had to explain some Abhidhamma behind it. So some days we'll be able to cover five, six questions per day. So hope, hopefully we'll be able to uh, finish the entire book. So I conclude the lecture, giving you the opportunity to ask, ask the questions. Okay. So you can read it out. You can read it out. Yeah, it has been uh, said. Yeah. Okay. So uh, I think you have already explained that Buddha statues are not the same. Why did Buddha preach to pay homage to stupas and bow trees, bow tree? Because they resemble him. Yes, that they, they, are, they are just signs, yes. They are just signs. And, and, and uh, bodhi trees, we'll, we'll talk about that, why, why he chose to plant a bodhi tree. Because uh, we are actually, uh, when we go into the tradition, we have two ways of paying respect to the bodhi tree. That's something I will discuss in a, in a future lecture. Uh, so you can pay res you are paying respect to the Buddha because it signifies or it, it, it refers to the Buddha and later on we also pay respect to the Bodhi tree as well because it is something being used by the Buddha and it's something is related to the Buddha 
and uh, Chetiyas pagodas because they they are enshrined with uh, Buddha's uh, relics. So obviously, if we can pay respect to the Buddha's body, any body part is obviously deserves veneration. Then Buddha statues are just signs referring to him. For example, even there is no sign, we can just pay respect to the Buddha thinking with our mind. But the benefit of having a Buddha statue is you can get that feeling of his presence. That's the point. So even while we are respect, that's why I explained in the Abhidhamma point in terms of the Abhidhamma. So when we are paying, for example, there is no Buddha statue here. Yeah, there is one behind actually. So there is no Buddha statue in front. So if I pay respect to the Buddha, looking, looking at the thin air, so I am still uh, referring to the Buddha with my mind. So I am getting the merits of paying respect to the Buddha. But when I have a Buddha statue in front of me, I have the sense of his presence. Still I am referring to the past Buddha who has passed away. So I have that sense of presence. When there is a pagoda, we have a sense. So it is very easy for most of the people to have that feeling. So that is why even you can pay respect to the Buddha without any statue. The benefit of having one is that you get that sense, you get that feeling. And if the Buddha statue was made very nice, they will not resemble to the Buddha at all. Obviously, because none of us have seen, we don't know what was his actual features were. It, we don't know that. So, so therefore, they cannot be the same as the Buddha. But anyway, because even we are paying respect to the Buddha with closed eyes, we are getting a certain mental image which is not accurate with the actual Buddha. So still we get the merits because we are referring to him. So even through a Buddha statue, by respect to the Buddha statue, we are referring to him. We are referring to him. So, so that is the, that's the point here. So, so Buddha has, uh, according to the commentary, Buddha has, and also Buddha has said in, in Mahaparanibbana Sutta, uh, that these Buddhas, Pacheka Buddhas, Arahants and Chakravartis deserve to be, deserve, they are two paraha puggal. Two paraha means uh, it's, 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 they are worthy of uh, getting stupas, monuments built for them. And people who respect these monuments would get accumulate great merit that, that is beneficial for them uh, throughout the sansara. Mm. Uh, but then, uh, there is another, another question from uh, Mr. Nandana. Can you can proceed with your question? Uh, Samana, sir. Uh, my question is, is there any, uh, in this lecture once it is mentioned about Chittani, uh, I don't know whether there is any difference between Chittani and Sankhara Nimitta. Sankhara Nimitta, what did you mean by Sankhara Nimitta? Are you referring to Sankhara Nimitta in Vipassana or what? <laughs> On, under which context? Uh, no, sir, no, sir. We have heard the word somewhere. Uh, I want to know whether there is any difference or similarity between Chitta Nimitta and Sankara Nimitta. Here, is like, this, is like this, this is like this. Sankara Nimitta has two meanings. And this has no relation with this, this. But now it's like this. There are actually two meanings in it. And you can, uh, you can, defy, you can create another third meaning as well. Sankara Nimitta in some context refer to the Sankara themselves. Sankara Nimitta are the Sankaras. For example, in the Bhaitu Pattana Jnana, yogis, yogi is asked to contemplate as Sankara Nimittang Bhayang, Uppado Bhayang Nimittang Bhayang, Nimitta is Sankaras. Sankaras are the Nimittas. Sankara means Sankara Nimitta, they are identical. And when it comes to Animitta, Animitta Anupassana or Animitta Vimokha, Sankara, Nimitta of a Sankara is a quality that enables us to differentiate it from one Sankara. Every Sankara has its own Nimitta, it is one kind of uh, individual property in it, that is, which is a unique property that enables us to differentiate. For example, if you even take two identical papers, we will still have, th they contain their uh, some identity, unique identity. That unique identity, that's, the, its scope can be very various. So that, that quality that, that a Sankara possesses is called Sankara Nimittas. In the name Sankara Nimitta. So, in some places, Sankara itself is called Sankara Nimitta, and some places it is an attribute that the Sankara possess. then, uh, possesses. Then, uh, when you are in uh, contemplating Vipassana, uh, you focus on Sankaras, and 
you have a certain mental image because you are not able to see the sankaras as they are. For example, none of us will be able to see the rising and falling of a one chitakkana. So, but we'll also be seeing, always be seeing uh, 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 some some lineage of chittas and so forth. So, therefore, uh, the way the sankara appears to our mind in vipassana meditation can also be called sankara nimitta. That is a term that you can construct. But the actual two meanings of Sankara Nimitta, in one place it refers to the Sankara themselves, Sankaras themselves, and also uh, an attribute of the Sankara. So I must say, is it correct if I understand? I, we cannot hear you, your voice was break, break, uh, breaking. I mean, it's a Sankara. I couldn't hear your question. Patavi, I just heard Patavi only. Is it correct if I understand like this? Patavi is a Sankara. If I understand something, hardness is a Sankara. If I understand some, like this, it's a hardness of iron bar and hardness of a pot, clay pot. Is that the difference between two Sankara? Is that the Sankara Nimitta? Yeah, that is one type of a Sankara Nimitta, yes. Thank you very much, Sankara. I think uh, next is uh, Mrs. Kumari Nalundani. Can you proceed uh, with your question, please? Well, can I answer another question? Because it has been sent to an app inbox. So, uh, there is a question says uh, many people criticize material offerings and which is uh, answer uh, saying not to do them and as uh, only practice of Dhamma leads to the path of Nibbana and uh, asking Bhante, could you kindly uh, clarify this matter? What, what do you mean by material offerings? Is it meaning like, for example, we offer maybe, things uh, to... Maybe uh, Amisa Puja or something. Okay, Amisa Puja. Amisa, I mean, sometimes we do offer material things to poor people, right? Which is a dan. I think none of, none of the, none of, none of, no one would uh, criticize that. So it's also a material offering. Then I think most of the people would ask the question why you are paying, offering things to the Buddha. Uh, th 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 that question is already been, will be discussed in, the, in these lectures. Uh, so, uh, if you are offering the thing to the Buddha while he was alive, yes, that's, that's allowable, right? That's, that's obvious. And the question that arises uh, while we are making material offerings to the Buddha who has passed away. For that, we have to go into the fundamentals of Theravada teachings. For example, uh, in order for how could a met, met, uh, how could an offering, what are the factors that fulfill the offerings, even while the person is alive or not, even while the person is alive. For example, if I'm making a dedication to the Buddha, so I'm making it in front of him. Okay, I, he, he he used it, he, he took it and he ate it. For example, consumed it. Now I make a send, a, I, I dedicate this food to the Buddha while he's not there. He is coming now. I am unable to. Uh, he is coming to the house or so to our to our place. But I am I am so busy that I have to leave the place. So I dedicate this to him and leave. Right? He comes and consumes it. Okay. Then I dedicate this to the Buddha. Then it happened that uh, he had another meal. For example, I already dedicated it. So am I getting the merits for my dedication? That's the obvious question. Even though he didn't consume it. Seems yes, because I have dedicated it. Because the dana is not completed just because someone has consumed it. It's completed because of two factors. It has to be something that belongs to me. I have to, I, that's why I am able to dedicate it, to offer it. And I have given up that. I have, I have dedicated it to somebody. It's, it's, it's something that belongs to me, the offering, the thing that has been offered. And I dedicate it to someone. Or I, I just relinquish it on behalf of someone. For someone. With these, these two factors, uh, the offering is completed. Now imagine this scenario. Imagine this scenario. Now Buddha is living in the Jetavana monastery. I can dedicate it even from here. For example, I can say this, I can say go and give this to Buddha, though, then he offers it, it is to him. I can say it is already given to the Buddha, go and offer it to him. So uh, when am I going to get the merits? Because this is my offering. I am giving up because I may go and sleep afterwards. 
So while he's offering the offering to the thing to the Buddha. So my offering is completed when I when I made this offering. So the next question that can arise is now I'm going to offer this to an Arahant, imagine Arahant, and he's in that monastery, and I, I offered it at 1 p.m. 1 p.m. Unfortunately, without me being aware of that, that person, the Arahant has attained Parinibbara at 12.30 p.m. So would I be getting the merits of my donation or not? The answer is yes. The answer is yes. Because I have made the offering, I made the dedication. Unfortunately, he is not going to use it. And he has passed away. So according to Theravada teachings, uh, making material offerings to a past of a Buddha. We will be discussing this in length in, in our coming lectures. So I will leave this for, I will just uh, uh, restrain myself for this answer, uh, for, for this amount of answer. And uh, so, so it does not matter the person is alive or not, according to Theravada fundamentals. One can argue on this. I am not saying this is. This, because if someone is arguing about the karma, then I, this is not the way to answer him, if someone is arguing about the karma. So if someone believes in karma, if someone respects Theravada fundamentals, then you have to always obvious the answer, ask the question, uh, when is the dana is coming? Because why did I say this so frank and directly? No one is going to reject offering meals to the Buddha who is alive, right? No one is going to offer, reject offering meals to poor people who are, who are going to benefit out of it. No one is going to, no one is going to reject that. So, so only thing they would be rejecting is offering, offering, making offerings to Buddha who has passed away. So that's why I made the made the made the fundamentals saying that. So whether his his presence or livingness, I would say livingness, the nature of living doesn't matter in the end. According to the other fundamentals. So should we make offerings or practice? Making offerings is a part of practice. So now I think. Most of the ones who are making this, if, if this question was raised, ones would not say that if, if you are making offerings to the poor, they would not say that's, that you go and practice without making offerings. Then you, have, you, you are having a huge problem of uh, the basic human qualities. Dana is something that has been praised by the Buddha and also it's, it's obvious thing that we should be doing. And so, so offerings... Then one, one would be asking, doing pujas and doing mandanas and all this. We can talk about that later in Lent. Uh, these are all part of the practice. So what matters in the end is having a wholesome mind all the time. So when you are paying respect to the one, for example, if someone is contemplating the Buddha Nusati as a meditation subject, you can gain a concentration out of it and you can follow uh, 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 Vipassana and attain liberation. So while we are doing a chanting, paying respect to the Buddha, what, what are we saying? We are saying nothing other than the Buddha's qualities. So if you are meditating as Buddha, so Buddha Nusuti is a meditation subject mentioned in the scriptures, by the, in the suttas by the Buddha himself. And uh, if you are reciting it in front of a Buddha statue, it's a part of meditation. Because even you are close to your eyes and keep on contemplating the Buddha's qualities and you are paying respect to a Buddha, Buddha statue, still you are reciting the uh, Buddha's qualities. So if you know the meaning, so there's no nothing much difference in it, because meditation can done be in the initial stages. You can do the meditation by reciting. For example, there are stories of uh, ancient monks who attain arahantship, you attain Magapala actually, uh, during the initial stage of recitation, recitation of the meditation subjects. So so yeah, so we'll talk about that in detail. Uh, offering material things is not is not out of the practice. It's not out of the practice. Yes, he did say in the Parinibbana Sutta, offering flowers doesn't uh, signify the real respect. Yes, obvious. If you are just, it's part of the practice actually. But you are just paying, paying, offering, offering flowers and so forth, but not practicing sila samadhi and panya. Yeah, that's that's just you are doing partial thing. It's just doing a partial thing. It's not, it's, but is it worthy? Is it is it a waste of making offerings? No, not at all. Because we have ample of stories of ancient Mahateras, Maha Arahants, who related to their past lives, saying that he offered these and these flowers, made all these offerings in the past lives, and with the help of that merit, they got into this life and attained Arahantship. So, so, so it's, if someone says that that's just it's just a statement, doesn't have any validity at all. 
uh, offering signifies is also part of our practice. But if someone uh, just just satisfy him or herself just through offerings and without practicing higher practices, that is something needed to be addressed. We would say you can also do some practice uh, rather than only doing these merits. But that if that is the only thing that he can do, he or she can do, that's that's much better than doing nothing. That's much better than doing nothing. So so we also have to understand the practicalities, the situations, and all this. Yeah, it's just uh, it has to be addressed in a in a broader context. But uh, offering material things never contradicts with the Buddha's explanations. Uh, have you got any uh, one minute? Uh, there's another, another question. Uh, yeah, yeah, go ahead, ask. Uh, this is Kumari Nirundani. You can proceed with your question. You can submit your question now. Uh, at the beginning, I got this question, but uh, in the middle and at the end, I got the answer for that. But I would like to have a uh, further clarification. Uh, uh, I, I heard that by embodying the teaching and leading a mindful uh, without going to the past and future, as you said, uh, compassionate life, Buddhists should honor the Buddha in spirit rather than through physical representations like bodies. But, sorry, sorry, uh, sorry. I beg your pardon, I didn't get the last part. Can you repeat the question again? Uh, uh, yes, uh, I mean, uh, to honor the Buddha, the best way of honoring the Buddha is uh, in spirit uh, rather than through physical representations like stupas, Buddha statues. For, but without stupas and statues, isn't it difficult for a person, especially for children, uh, uh, who have not reached to the path to cultivate that uh, mental state. Uh, I, I, because I've got first-hand experience with my children, uh, when I have a Buddha statue, it is easy for me to persuade them for that path, uh, even to observe passive. But um, for in that case, I'm these uh, physical representatives very effective in that regard? Obvious is not, not only for children. Oh. Yes, I, I hope you have presented your question. So, uh, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's not only for children, even for adults, even for the ones who have uh, grown up in spirituality. Still, still you, when you see a Buddha statue, that's the time that the sense of the Buddha comes into our mind. And it's very easy for us to have that idea. And uh, even you can contemplate looking at the Buddha statues and start to uh, do the contemplation of Buddha's attributes. So it, the physical representation is very helpful to our mind. It's not only for children. So uh, yes, uh, making uh, pagodas have been instructed by the Buddha. That means pagodas means monuments. Instructed means uh, he says that be, the Bhutapagata deserves that. And by paying respect to these monuments, built for them, for four types of people, Buddha, Pachyaka Buddhas, Arahans, and Chakravarti Rajas, the universal monarchs, many people accumulate great merits and uh, will be born in good destinations. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's something that is very useful and a custom that has been followed in, for traditions. And... Uh, it's, 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 the, it's just uh, what matters to us is how do we consider about it? How do we consider about it? And uh, Bodhi tree is also a representation of the Buddha. And the relics themselves are the part of the Buddha. Are the part of the Buddha. So uh, if, if we, for example, if we happen to... Now imagine if, if someone is capable of giving, getting the Jesus Christ cloth that he wore while he was being crucified. It's something that is that is so valuable for the Christian people. It's something that they would really honor. Even, for example, the one if you if you find a king who served the country, if you find his his crown or if you happen to find his sword, that would be something something very valuable for the 
for the ones who really respect him. So that the honor, the respect, it, 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 it can evoke that feeling. Uh, so in the same way, uh, if we can find something that was used by the Buddha himself, that would evoke that sense about the Buddha and we can easily... Because if someone can pay respect to the Buddha without a monument, the ones who are practicing would pay respect to the Buddha, right? Before sitting, they pay, so they are paying respect to the Buddha without a monument. What is the, what is the philosophy behind that? A mind is capable of referring to some object, some reality that existed now, which is not existing at the moment. So what we are doing through a Buddha statue is referring to that person. We are not paying respect to this statue. We are paying respect to the Buddha who, whom we refer through this statue. That's what matters. So otherwise the statue is just a material, uh, a heap of material stones or sand or whatever, 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 whatever the mixture is, it is. It has no value at all. It has some value in terms of commerciality, but as a commodity, but it's not, not, not in the sense of deserving veneration. Therefore, uh, but we refer to that actual person who existed 2,500 years ago through this material thing. If, if there is no material thing, we are referring to him directly. Okay. So then what's the, what the, obvi the ob obvious question that arises, when it is easier for you to refer to him, is it just through the mind or just looking at a Buddha statue? If someone says it's easy for me to refer to the Buddha without looking at a Buddha statue, it's up to him or her. But if, if for most of us, it's obviously, for even for myself, if you have a very nicely uh, made Buddha statue, uh, the, the, the feeling that, that, that arises in me is quite, quite different when I'm making a uh, respecting gesture to him uh, in my own. Bhante, I think well, that's all for today. Okay. okay. And now uh, it's all. Uh, it's uh, it's finished. Uh, some answer. Okay. Okay. Then uh, thank you for listening. Hello. Bhante. Oh yes. You have raised your hand. Yeah. Bhante, can can I ask you a question? Maybe it's nothing to do with the uh, Dharma Ministerial lesson. Uh, this question is bothering me quite some time. I'm, I'm trying to get an answer. Can you hear me, Bhante? Yes, I can hear you. Uh, this is something, when Arahat become Arahat, they remove all the Klesha, bad Klesha. But when Buddha become Buddha, what is the difference between Buddha and Arahat when they attain Nirvana? Is it something to do with Vasana? And can you elaborate on Vasana? I'm not clear on Vasana. The Nibbana they attain, there is no difference in it. It's the same Nibbana. The Nibbana is just one. It's a single reality. And it's not the singularity it's, which is called discussed in Upanishad. Uh, this single reality is uh, the state of non-arising of suffering. So in terms of the Nibbana they are experienced, they have experienced or they have attained, they are not in Nibbana. The suffering has extinguished, has been, and that there is no difference in it. It is the same. Whoever the Buddha is in the past, in the present, or who will attain in future, or even we attain Nibbana one day, so all this is the same Nibbana. The difference between an Arahant and a Buddha lays on few few factors. It's not only about Arahant, we have three categories, Buddhas, Pacheka Buddhas and Arahants. So in order, the, fundamentally they have removed all the defilements. It happens from the Sotapannahut, starting from the Sotapanna stage. At the stage of Arahantul, you remove all the defilements that can cause a rebirth. If the defilements of, of rebirth are removed, there cannot be any rebirth again, so it means the cessation of suffering. The Namarupa process is happening. Suffering is about to come. A lot of suffering is about to come, which has not arisen yet. As long as the causes are there, the suffering is supposed to arise. So, why this we are not free from this suffering, even though it has not arisen yet, because the cause is there. 
because any time we die we are we are supposed to be born again that is called the suffer non arisen suffering if an asteroid is coming towards the sea and coin is about to cause a tsunami even before it has hit the earth we still take precautions and run away why is that we are we are we, we are afraid of the we fear the non arisen tsunami why do we fear non arisen tsunami because the cause is coming the asteroid is coming if the asteroid is destroyed then we'll be relief we'll will will we'll relax because say, okay the cause is gone the tsunami is not going to come so the suffering which is going to come is something very special in our lives because as long as the causes are there even though the suffering has not arisen it is about to come so what happens to an arahant is they remove the defilements that can cause this rebirth so mm. there are defilements so we they remove the defile it happens starts from the stages of sotapannahood so this in order to remove the defilements it can be done with the done by the chitta call the wisdom call magganyana the wisdom in the path which understands or which penetrates the nibbana and also understand the four noble truths suffering uh, the cause of suffering cessation of suffering and the path leading to the cessation of suffering which we call the four noble truths chatu arya satya in single is we will call chaturari satya so these four noble truths are understood by the magganyana is a wisdom and this wisdom is developed through uh, relentless practice for 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 years throughout throughout many lives actually then what happens this magganyana arises in four times as sotapatti magganyana sakadagami magganyana nagami magganyana and arahanta magganyana and arahanta magganyana is, is so all these four are eradicate in defilements to some degree and the arahanta magganyana eradicates what is remnant it doesn't eradicate all the defilements it it removes what is what is remnant so eradication starts with the sotapannahood now what happens is so in order to eradicate the defilements we have to have the wisdom wisdom about the four noble truths so this wisdom how one is going to get this wisdom some people most of the beings get this wisdom with the help of someone else either from the buddha or a disciple of the buddha or through the books and all whatever mm -hmm. so those ones who already gain this in the wisdom of four noble truths with the help of others and eradicate all the defilements are called arahants and some beings very special ones are capable of understanding these four noble truths by themselves without the help of someone else whenever they are ready they understand this and eradicate all the defilements and they are called pacheka buddha they also do it in in, in four stages they also go through sotapannahud sakadagami danagami danantu and the difference between a sotapan uh, arahant and a pacheka buddha is they have done it by themselves which is a great margin of difference because even venerable sariputta would not be able to understand it by himself unless asa venerable asa ji or any other disciple or buddha had preached him preaching the dhamma so pacheka buddhas are capable of doing it by themselves so that is a huge difference so they are they are they are far more greater than noble uh, disciples like us because in order to do that penetrate and understand the noble truths by themselves is something not is not an is not an easy task is not something very simple so and uh, with that wisdom when they become arahants when they become ar when they be arham is pacheka buddhas you can call them arahants as well but when they become pacheka buddha their wisdom their blossoming of wisdom is vast much greater than that of arahant because uh, obviously they they accumulated great paramis and merits in order to uh, get that capacity of understand the four noble truths by themselves and then so there's another but even though they are capable of understanding by themselves they are not capable of preaching it to others putting it into words so they are self enlightened persons but unable to lead others to the liberation they it's not that they don't have the compassion they don't have the capacity to bring forth this experience and put it into words so that others could liberate listen to it then there is another type of beings who are who understand these four noble truths by themselves and whose wisdom is so vast vast much more greater than some apacheka buddha so they are able to put this understanding into words and also show the path and also help the others to uh, come uh, to eradicate the defilements or the understand the noble truths that they have understood but that those persons have a full amount of wisdom 
So they are fully enlightened. We call they are fully enlightened. But even they go through these four stages. The Bodhisattva under the Bodhi tree became a Sotapanna first, then became a Sakadagami, Anagami, and then finally a Arahant. He is Arahantud at the moment of big Arahantud is eradicating all the remnant ones. But he is a Samma Sumbuddha because he did it by himself and he is capable of teaching it to others. So at that stage of Arahantud of a Pacheka Buddha, he is called a Pacheka Buddha because he did it by himself. But the others are called normal Arahants because they are doing it with the help of others. So that is the main difference between them. Then when they eradicate the defilements, there is something called defilements that can cause the birth, which we call the defilements, kilesas. So their latent stage is called anusaya, or sometimes we, we, we call it appahina avatha. Appahina means uneradicated. It's not a normal, not a proper word actually. English word, normally we use the word uneradicated. It's a constructed word. Kilesas that are not eradicated. I, I may use that word uneradicated for the convenience, convey, uh, convenience of the usage. So these uneradicated defilements, uh, not only the uneradicated defilements, they are based on them, they are, we normally develop a certain habitual patterns, which we call vasana. Mm -hmm. A similarity is now, when an elephant is bound with the chains for a longer period, he is unable to stretch his legs. So he walks in a certain way, in a, in a, not like a wild elephant. But if, if he was chained for many years, and even after the chains have been removed, he'll be having that same way of walking, uh, even though he could stretch his legs very well. But that, that, that is the habit that he has. His body and everything uh, has adapted to this uh, old lifestyle. Even though chains are removed, he'll be behaving the same way. So likewise, these defilements cause a certain habitual, cause certain habitual tendencies within us. Even we have it at the moment. So eradication at the moment of Magganyana, when you eradicate the defilements, uh, they eradicate the defilements, but, but the habitual things are not fully eradicated. So uh, when you look into the literature, it seems like certain Arahants do eradicate def uh, these habitual defilements, habitual habits caused by the defilements, which we call Vasana, not in the Singhali sense of Vasana. Uh, this is like, uh, these are the defilements that have been made to live in our mind stream for a longer period not the luck. So, so these uh, uh, vasana kelesas, uh, some arahans, it seems, according to the literature, they are eradicating to some extent, not entirely. So, Sariputta would also eradicate to some extent. But surely, every arahant, Pacheka Buddha and Sammasam Buddha, eradicate the defilements which can cause the rebirth. They are completely gone. But the, that, that, that habits that were caused, the habitual tendencies in the mind due to the defilements, cannot be eradicated entirely it's by Arahans. And also by uh, Pacheka, sorry, by Pacheka Buddhas, they cannot be, those things cannot be eradicated. So, Sammasam Buddhas, when they eradicate the defilement, they completely eradicate the entire Kelesas together with the uh, Vasana oh. tendencies. So, what happens is, the next point is, now defilements are the, uh, the next aspect is the defilements, so that's the difference of them. Defilements are the obstacles for the wisdom. So when we have strong defilements, we are unable to choose the correct thing. So that's why when sometimes when you have hatred, when we have uh, attachment, so we are unable to make a proper judgment. So that's, that's obvious in our day-to-day -day lives, right? Even when we are making certain decisions in our life, maybe social or economical or in terms of the country or whatever, whatever, we, we are more inclined, we are unable to make a proper decision. If we have a grudge towards someone, if we have attachment towards someone, so we will be biased based on our uh, things, right? So normally these things happen in elections, these things happen in our marriages and all these, so we are influenced by our defilements most of the time. So, uh, so defilements hinder our wisdom. So more the defilements are lessened, wisdom starts to blossom. If it is in, in, removed, the wisdom can come into its full capacity. It's not only the defilements that are hindering our wisdom, the vasana, the, ten, the vasana kilesas are also hindering, are also obstacles. So if, when the arahants have completely eradicated the defilements, so their wisdom is, has blossomed to a great extent, but still it has a resistance by the uh, vasana defilements, vasana kilesas. So more the resistance is lower, the blossoming of wisdom is greater. So Pacheka Buddhas still have some amount of vasana, but they have a greater, greater wisdom. But they are not, their wisdom has not reached the 100% efficacy. Efficacy. 
So, but for with the Samasambuddha, when he eradicates the defamers, he removes or with the defamers together with the tendencies, Vasana tendencies. So, there is no other obstacle in his mind, in his mind stream for his wisdom. So, it reaches the highest, highest level and that reaching or culmination of wisdom is called the Sabbanyuta Jnana, the omniscience. So, this is the next difference between Pacheka Buddha, Arahant and Samasambuddha. But all of them, the liberation they have attained, there is no difference at all because they all attain the same liberation. Thanks for the perfect comment, sir. Thank you so much. Okay. Right. So, shall we conclude then? Yes, sir. It's okay. all for today. No? Okay. So, now it's time to transfer the merits and also uh, conclude our session. On this day, the Dhamma sermon is kindly sponsored by uh, Udhyani Unantenna, Vishwa Unantenna, uh, Trishala Unantenna, Navik, Thanidi, Anupama Unantenna, all are all Unantenna, Udhyani Unantenna, Vishwa Unantenna, Trishala Unantenna, Navik Unantenna, Thanidi Unantenna, Anupama Unantenna, uh, Samara Divakara from Anupam Unantana Samana Divakara from Switzerland. So these are the ones who sponsored this Dhamma talk. Uh, the main purpose of this offering of Dhamma is to transfer merits to the late uh, Shanti Mavis. No? I hope I'm pronouncing correctly. Shanti Mavis. That's Shanti Mavis. Mavis, okay. Mavis. That's okay. Uh, Shanti Mavis Unantana, our beloved mother, the late grandparent, the late Nihal Mami, and the late Totiyammis, right? Okay. Totiyammis and Dayamma. Yes, Totiyammis and Dayamma who cared for us since childhood. So, we share this merit of, uh, uh, of Dhamma Dana, of making, giving the chance for many to uh, listen to the Dhamma. So, may these late uh, deceased ones, Shanti Mavis Sunantana, uh, their grandparents, Nihal Mami, Toti Ammis and Daya Amma, who, uh, who have already passed away, may they enjoy these merits of done by their children and their beloved ones, and may they be free from suffering. If, if in case if they are suffering or if they are in, in already in happiness, may the happiness enhances by this sharing of merit, and may they all rejoice in this merit. The purpose of this dhamma suffering is for the uh, for the accumulation of merits from this noble Dhamma offering to be transferred to all beings. May all beings rejoice on this merit. And may all devas rejoice in these mer transferred merits and may all of them enjoy the divine pleasures and one day finally attain the liberation. May all the noble monks, including Venerable Monk Vihari, preach of the Dhamma sermon who have blessed us with the Dhamma rejoice in, the, uh, in these transferred merits. Yes, I do enjoy your sharing. Uh, we humbly transfer the merits of this Dhamma sermon to Venerable Buddha Rakita Tera, who graciously supported us in making this Dhamma offering possible. So may he be happy and may he have a very fruitful uh, sasana life and may Venerable be able to attain all his uh, fulfill, uh, uh, wishes. May these merits also be transferred to Mr. Vajira Ranasinghe of Switzerland who provided Zoom app for the Dhamma sermon and to his late beloved father and Vajira have been supporting the Dhamma sermons by providing this, this app and may he be also uh, gain all the benefits uh, in mundane and spiritual aspects and also may his father rejoice on this merit and may he be happy and attain the Nibbana soon. May all those who attended today's Dhamma sermon to listen to the preachings also rejoice in these transferred merits. And finally, the ones who organized this talk, Udhyani Unantana, Vishnu Unantana, Trishala Unantana, Navi Unantana, Tanidi Unantana, Anupam Unantana, Samaradivarkara, may all of you be able to, uh, uh, with this merit, may all of you be able to attain the, uh, the correct view throughout the entire sansara and to associate, and we'll be fortunate to associate good friends who would lead you towards the liberation soon and also the ones who join the talk and listen to the talk may this merit be a helpful assistance for you to grow in dhamma and to be born in blissful states and also to attain the nibbana soon and also special thanks to uh, mrs uddhani unantan and vishu unantan for organizing these events and uh, prasad disoisa for for this uh, uh, recording and uh, broadcasting and all the ones who have joined. So, we will transfer the merits by reciting the gathas. 
idang bo nyati nang hotu sukita hontu nyata yo idang bo nyati nang hotu sukita hontu nyata yo idang bo nyati nang hotu sukita hontu nyata yo akasatha ca bhumatha deva naga mahiddhika punyantang anumoditva ciran rakkantu sambuddha sasana akasatha ca bhumatha deva naga mahiddhika punyantang anumoditva ciran rakkantu sambuddha desana akasatha ca bhumatha deva naga mahiddhika punyantang anumoditva ciran rakkantu sambuddha savaka Cirang rakan tu tan sa dai mina punya kami ne mami bala sama gemu satan sama gemu hutu ya bani bana pati ai mina punya kami ne mami bala sama gemu satan sama gemu hutu ya bani bana pati ai mina punya kami ne mami bala sama gemu satan sama gemu hutu ya bani bana pati ai dami punya kama Asavakaya vahang hotu, idam me punya kamang, asavakaya vahang hotu, idam me punya kamang, asavakaya vahang hotu, sabbedukha pamunchetum.